What now? What now? What now? What now? What now? So what now? Take cover, Lee Evans is coming to BBC One. A new series starts Monday, 26th of March. Now on BBC One, we join BBC News 24. In the United States, a jury has found one of the biggest names in rap music, Sean Coombs, known as Puff Daddy, not guilty of illegal gun possession and bribery. Mr. Coombs was cleared of charges relating to an incident in a New York nightclub two years ago. From New York, Jane Hughes has this report. After an agonizing two and a half day wait for a verdict, there was no disguising Sean Combs' relief at being cleared of all charges. I'm just really right now, I'm just very emotional, um, I'm at really a loss, I'm just very emotional, I'm just, I feel blessed, you know, I just, I'm just so, you know. The multi-millionaire rapper can now get back to doing what he loves, making and producing hip-hop. It was here in Club New York that he ran into trouble. He came here to party with his then-girlfriend Jennifer Lopez and was just leaving when bullets began flying. This is BBC One. I'm sorry Police we're not able to bring... Police were quickly on the scene and Puff Daddy was arrested being driven away at high speed with a gun in his car. But he took the witness stand himself to deny having anything to do with the shooting. The jury believed his account and instead found his protégé, Jamal Shine Barrow, guilty of firing a gun in the nightclub. Puff Daddy was represented by some of the best lawyers money can buy, including Johnny Cochran of O.J. Simpson fame. I just want to say that this is a, a great exhilarating victory for Sean Combs. It's a victory really for all of us because he was wrongly accused. These last 14 months have been very, very tough. But Puff Daddy's still not completely in the clear. He has a billion dollars worth of lawsuits hanging over his head, and he may yet face a civil trial. He's not going to be able to forget the shooting at Club New York for a long while. Jane Hughes, BBC News, New York. This is BBC News, a reminder of the headlines. As fighting intensifies in Macedonia, the United Nations is warning of another refugee crisis in the Balkans. And the two surviving hijackers of the Russian airliner are wanted in Moscow to stand trial. And still to come, can it rise from the ashes? The reconstruction of Venice's famous opera house runs into trouble. A brutal week is over for the world's beleaguered stock markets. The high-tech stock exchange Nasdaq in New York closed below 1,900, a fall of nearly 25% from a year ago. It looks like many stock market traders will have a few sleepless nights ahead of them, worrying about the week's trading. These New Yorkers stopped and stared on Friday. Inside these glass walls flickers the evidence of a grim week. The sell-off didn't stop. Among the latest triggers, more job cuts at tech firms. Compact's cutting 5,000 jobs. It's not the job cuts, it's why that investors care about. The world's number two software firm, Oracle, then blamed a vicious economic slowdown. Our growth has slowed up so much. We were growing so rapidly, and that growth has gone down to, you know, one uh, percent or so that it feels like a recession, though we may not be technically in a contraction. Weighing on each shoulder for investors, another week of heavy losses and a week too in which they spread because the Dow Jones, for instance, had been flat for almost a year, but this was the week when it pushed back down beneath 10,000 points and also marked one of the worst five-day periods in a decade. Ebullience abounded when the Dow first passed through 10,000 on the way up. These seem distant echoes now as that mark passed by on the way down this week. Then at week's close on Friday, there was a fresh search for some consensus on how much the US Federal Reserve will cut rates next week. We do think there's weakness underlying the economy and the Fed's going to come there really to save the economy, not to save Wall Street portfolio managers. 
The world's stock markets are performing a line dance. News from Japan, Europe and the United States has all been blamed for triggering fresh selling this week. But history says these markets will come back. It's just that it can't tell us when. Patrick O'Connell, BBC News, New York. The British government is facing growing criticism from farmers over its decision to slaughter thousands of apparently healthy animals in an attempt to contain the foot and mouth disease. A farming pressure group says it will take legal proceedings. Some farmers have even spoken of barricading themselves in their properties to prevent their livestock from being destroyed. The fight against foot and mouth is clearing British fields. The suggestion of a risk is now enough for mass slaughter to be the answer. That means these Cumbrian lambs, only hours old, will not live much longer. The policy is any animal within two miles of a confirmed case will be killed. Many farmers say that is something they will not accept. They, they can have all the rights in the world, but they'll not get through this gate. Definitely not. What would but, you do? I'm thinking about it. But I'm not alone. All my neighbours have the same opinion. The pyres are already being built, a clear sign of the destruction to come. Police have revealed that they today have taken firearms from a farmer who allegedly threatened officials who came to kill his animals. This has had a devastating effect on the people in, and the farming community in the county, quite understandably so. Um, but when it comes to making threats, uh, and particularly where firearms are involved, um, we uh, need to respond to that. There is now talk of rural revolt. Only a small demonstration today at Abbey Town in northern Cumbria, but feelings were clear. I just want to fight for what's right, huh? Yeah, exactly. Mr. Brown's do we're trying to do his job, but I'm trying to do mine. We've done everything we can to keep the infection of our farm. It's still going to lose them. But the government says the plan of a mass slaughter of sheep to trap the disease is still the right one. We're not culling animals uh, that are free of disease, we're culling animals that are at risk and may be harbouring the disease. If there was some way of telling which ones were which, of course we would use it, but there isn't. Many farmers now feel that it is politics and not science that is leading the fight against this disease. There was support for the animal movement ban, but that is being replaced in many areas by anger, that this mass slaughter is too heavy-handed and too many people are suffering. Richard Bilton, BBC News, Northamptonshire. The Prime Minister of India, Abdul Bihari Vajpayee, has ordered an investigation into the alleged arms bribery scandal that led to the resignation of the Defence Minister, George Fernandes. Mr Vajpayee has appealed to the opposition parties to allow Parliament to, to get on with its work. Opposition politicians are demanding the resignation of the entire government, but that's been ruled out by the coalition leaders. The scandal centers on secret filming done by an Indian internet site that allegedly shows politicians, bureaucrats and army officers accepting bribes from reporters posing as arms dealers. In Iraq, two people were killed and at least 20 others were injured after a bomb exploded at a bus station in Baghdad city center. Security officials say the bomb was planted between two buses, but it's unclear who carried out the attack. Iraqi officials and media have apparently stepped up verbal attacks against the United States and Israel following last month's air raids against radar and military communication sites near Baghdad. There have been angry demonstrations in the West Bank town of Ramallah with hundreds of Palestinians calling for revenge and an end to the Israeli blockade. Palestinians are enraged by what they see as the continued occupation in, in checkpoints, travel restrictions and the cutting off of Palestinian towns from each other. Israel sees these as necessary measures to bolster its security. A 20-year-old stone thrower was killed by Israeli soldiers near the Karni crossing point on the Gaza Strip. A new crisis has hit the project to reconstruct the Venice Opera House La Fenice, which burned down in mysterious circumstances. The city's mayor is threatening to suspend work following a dispute with the German-Italian construction company. Meanwhile, the trial of two electricians charged with setting fire to the old opera house is entering its final stages. Tucked away on the lagoon's edge is an improbable refuge for Venice's glittering musical heritage. <laughs> Inside the big top, a Romanian diva is metamorphing into one of Puccini's tragic heroines.
Madame Butterfly is a sellout in a community addicted to grand opera. Five years ago, Venice's opera house, La Fenice, which means the Phoenix, caught fire. All the emergency services could do was prevent the inferno engulfing other historic buildings. In its terminal stages now is the trial of two electricians accused of starting the fire to hide their failure to finish a rewiring job. The prosecutor is pressing for seven-year jail sentences. Venezia, without La Fenice, is something um, incomplete. We do need it because it's, uh, it's one of the main items who define uh, the, 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 the idea, the, the same idea of Venice. The reconstruction of La Fenice is years behind target. Behind the scenes, rival companies fight for a share of the project and lawsuits are being prepared. Venice's opera boss is pessimistic. I don't expect to, to be there in my generation, knowing the musical life of Italy and knowing all the difficulties, all the bureaucracy here. I don't expect to be there at my lifetime. The only good news is a new temporary home for the opera's almost ready. The 17th century Malibran, closed and forgotten years ago, it's being refurbished, curtain up in May. And Madame Butterfly can escape from the nightmare acoustics of the big top. But for many music lovers, there's only one true shrine here in Venice, and that's the gutted remains of La Fenice, the phoenix that has yet to arise. It's become an operatic melodrama in its own right, a long way from a happy ending. Brian Barron, BBC News, Venice. This is BBC News, a reminder of the main headlines this hour. As fighting has intensified in Macedonia, the UN is warning of another refugee crisis in the Balkans. This is BBC News. Hello there. The weekend is upon us, so let's start by taking the broader picture. We've low pressure systems to the south, high pressure to the north. And the picture for Sunday really doesn't change very much. Weather fronts always never far away from the southern extremities of the British Isles. You'll notice the isobars remain tightly packed across the country throughout the weekend. We're going to see some strong and raw feeling winds. Now at the moment we've got a lot of wet weather around across the southern half of the country. Some really heavy downpours in places turning increasingly to sleet and snow over the hills as well. The main areas we're focusing on the Midlands and also Wales. Heavy downpours, thunderstorms, a lot of spray around on the roads for the rest of the night and also that snow falling over the higher routes where we could see as much as 10 to 15 centimetres. Further north, no such problems, clearing skies, but a frost, minus three or minus four across much of Scotland. Now eventually the cold air will win out. We'll start to see the frost gradually edging southwards, especially during the first half of next week. Some very frosty and icy nights to come then. The winds will eventually ease down, but through the weekend we're going to keep some strong, stiff breezes always coming in off the North Sea, always feeling raw, a distinctly chilly feel to the weekend. Temperature-wise, this is what we're looking at across the major cities, four to six Celsius in general, but when you add those winds on, well, it'll feel more like minus one to minus three. Quite cold indeed. A cold, frosty start for the northern half of the country, but a good deal of sunshine around. Some good sunny spells, just a scattering of wintry showers there in the far northeast. No such luck further south still with a lot of cloud, that rain, sleet and snow mixed in. Gradually the main band edges a little bit further south, perhaps brightening skies for North Wales and Lincolnshire, but by and large a fairly wet and cold afternoon. More snow to come as well for the Brecon Beacons and also the Cotswolds. Further north though, those showers may get going a little bit more, perhaps flirting with the northeast of England. But by and large the best chance of seeing some sunny weather across western Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now it's St Patrick's Day of course, take you back a couple of years and it was the warmest St Patrick's Day 
for 100 years, 15 to 17 Celsius. Not going to see anything like that today. Now Ireland, at the moment, not involved in the Six Nations, but Scotland take on Italy this afternoon. Chance of a sleet or a snow shower, but by and large I think it'll be fine, but always feeling cold, in, especially in that wind. And feeling cold everywhere really. Temperatures could get up to 9 Celsius in the south, but when you add on that wind, as we've seen, it won't feel anything like that. Now the outlook for Sunday, while well, we keep that strong wind around, so it will be feeling cold. A scattering of snow showers in the far north and also the east. That main rain band takes its time before it clears away. More sleet and snow to come in the far south, but a good deal of sunshine as well further west. Northern Ireland, western Scotland, northern parts of Wales. Temperature wise, 5 or 6 Celsius. Perhaps a touch milder on Monday, and by and large, more sunshine around, one or two showers around, the hints of some rain and thicker cloud perhaps edging in to the southwest later on. A reminder of where you'll need your brollies today for the football matches. I don't think you need one at Manchester United. Newcastle, there's a chance of catching a snow shower. Southampton likely to be wet, but it will be bitterly cold everywhere. Breaking the news. The mass slaughter of healthy animals is set to begin today. It's been a bleak day with share prices taking a battering. The alarm was raised by a consultant paediatrician on Monday night. A disciplinary hearing finally cleared Mrs Evans early this morning. 24 hours a day, BBC News 24. Hello, Clary. Hard talk. It's Tinseltown. Parts of it were so horrible that people actually burst out laughing. As Tim Sebastian meets the movers, shakers and the big money makers. This was my opportunity to make some money. Hard Talk Hollywood Week, all next week at 10.30 on BBC News 24. Hello, this is BBC News 24. I'm Raggy Omar. Summary of the main news now at just coming up to half past three. The Agriculture Minister, Nick Brown, has delayed for a few days the slaughter of healthy farm animals for the new policy to be properly explained to farmers. His announcement follows mounting resistance from farmers in North Cumbria. Some have spoken of stopping the slaughtermen from going onto their land. The government since insists the strict controls are essential to try to curb the disease. There were 17 new cases on Friday, bringing the total number to 273. An 18-year-old woman has been convicted of rape at Blackfriars Crown Court. Claire Marsh is the youngest female in this country ever to be convicted of the offence. She was part of the gang which attacked a 37-year-old woman and then threw her into the Grand Union Canal in West London. The judge called it a vile and horrifying sex attack. Macedonia's defence minister has warned that his country is on the brink of war after intensified fighting between ethnic Albanian rebels and the security forces. The crisis is centred on the northwestern town of Tetovo, close to the country's border with Kosovo, where a pitched battle has been raging for three days. German peacekeeping troops in the city have also come under rebel fire. A jury in New York has found the rap star Sean Puff Daddy Coombs not guilty of the illegal possession of a gun. He was also cleared of bribery. The charges arose from a shooting incident at a nightclub in New York in December 1999. The price of petrol in Britain could rise by at least two pence a litre after a meeting of the main oil producing countries, OPEC. The talks in Vienna have agreed a cut in oil production thought to be around one million barrels a day. The exact reduction will be announced later today. Rescue workers in Brazil are trying to prevent the sinking of the world's largest offshore oil platform. The giant structure is taking on water following a series of explosions on Thursday. The blasts have left one oil worker dead and nine others missing. It's feared that if the rig sinks, it will cause an environmental disaster. The Europe Minister Keith Vaz is facing more calls for his resignation with the publication of evidence from a parliamentary committee. He's faced repeated demands to resign over his links with prominent Asian businessmen. The Common Standards Committee report reveals the degree to which Mr Vaz failed to cooperate with the inquiry led by Elizabeth Filton. In a statement, Mr Vaz said he and his solicitor had responded to questions in a full and frank manner. The multi-million pound Eden project in Cornwall is set to open this weekend despite criticism from farmers worried about the foot and mouth crisis. 
The project has the largest greenhouses in the world and will house thousands of plants. Different climates have been created inside to demonstrate man's relationship with nature. This year's BBC comic relief appeal with its slogan, Say Pants to Poverty, has been the most successful in the charity's 13-year history. One of the highlights of the evening was comedian Billy Connolly bearing his all to unsuspecting passers-by in central London and droll comic Jack D was voted the winner of Celebrity Big Brother. The total so far stands at £22 million and, a half pounds and is expected to top £40 million by the close of the appeal. That's the news at exactly 3.33. Now on BBC News 24, it's time for Hard Talk. In 1973, an American journalist was executed without trial by the forces of General Augusto Pinochet as they overthrew the government of Chile. For a quarter of a century, the U.S. government claimed ignorance and obstructed investigations. Court cases against U.S. officials were thrown out for lack of evidence. Now, though, thousands of documents have been declassified and point to both knowledge and involvement of U.S. agencies in the killing. My guest today is the widow of the murdered journalist. How painful has it been to fight so long for the truth. Joyce Holman, a very warm welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Tim. Last year you filed suit in Chilean courts against General Pinochet. You also asked the Supreme Court for an investigation into your husband's death. How far has that got? Well, uh, there were two petitions. One went to Guzman's docket uh, with the case itself. Guzman is the magistrate who's been leading Thank the you. charge against yes, Pinochet. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, all of the cases against Pinochet get filed with Judge Guzman. And we also uh, petitioned the Supreme Court uh, for a special investigator, a special judge to investigate. Um, as it stands now, uh, I believe that the, the, the court is not going to give us a separate judge, which is fine. Uh, judge Guzman has our case, and we're very happy with that. Do you have any idea how good your chances are? You know, there continue to be revelations uh, um, about um, those times. And I think that now that senatorial immunity was stripped, uh, now that um, a caravan of death case seems to be entering, going to enter uh, court, I think there is a much better chance that uh, we will be able to investigate. It took 27 years, didn't it, to get any support from the State Department? It took 27 years. And uh, the what fact... What does that tell you about your government? It's successive governments, successive well, administrations, which, which have come and gone during that What it that tells period. me about the intelligence um, community is that um, they're very invested in protecting themselves, their jobs, and the way they go about their business. And even though President Clinton mandated the release of all these documents, his State Department was the biggest complier with that mandate. The CIA was sort of forced into giving up some documents uh, by members of Congress that were pressing for that. And the other intelligence agencies, like Navy Intelligence, Army Intelligence, National Security Council, they didn't give they didn't give anything up. But the documents themselves contained dynamite, didn't they? The six, some 16,000 documents have been declassified relating to what the U.S. knew or participated in inside Chile. There was dynamite in there, Actually, the there? volume was dynamite. When you see that many documents, you just know they're up to their ears, uh, I mean, without reading a word. So as far as you're concerned, the documents show a direct link between the U.S. government and the assassinations that were carried out by Pinochet's forces? To my mind, the answer is yes. The U.S. had a direct role in the overthrow of an elect uh, a democratically elected government, peaceful government, in uh, Chile in 1973. How hard has it been for you all these years to fight piece by piece, 
document by document, mm. to be lied to, to be blocked, to have so many disappointments pile up over the years. What's that been like for you? Well, honestly, Ed Horman um, was leading the charge. Charles's father. Yes, uh, initially. Uh, when we went to Congress, not that I didn't go along and say my piece, but honestly, I was, I was emotionally uh, overwhelmed by what had happened. And Ed Harmon was so outraged that his government would do this to his son. Having first believed in them. Having first believed in them. Just as the movie presents, uh, it was very much like that. He went to the Congress, we went to the Congress, we told our story, we said, this must never happen again. The Congress said, you're right, this is a terrible story, it must never happen again. They didn't, however, go ahead to investigate. Uh, even when the Church Committee investigated assassinations and the relationship of the U.S. government to Chile, they did not investigate the Charles Horman, the death of Charles Horman or Frank Terugi. It wasn't until... Was a friend of his. Actually, uh, Frank uh, was a little bit younger. He was a student, and th they were working together on some translations and some, uh, some work. Um, but Frank was in a little different place than uh, my husband Charles in terms of the work that, w that he was doing in Chile. Uh, Let me take you back to okay. 1973, for mm -hmm. to the time of the coup. Mm -hmm. What was Santiago like as the military tightened their grip? Paint me a picture of what the city was like during that time. At the coup? Yes. Well, um, you know, I, I was in our new home because uh, not that it was, uh, it was just a different home that we had moved to a few weeks before the coup. And our friend Terry had come to visit from New York and I had taken her to the mountains and we'd come back to Santiago, and uh, Charles was going to take her to the coast and so that she could leave because the polarization was in the air. There was a lot of tension in the air. But then that night the coup hit, and I was in Santiago, and Charles and Terry were in Viña del Mar, and I could hear the strafing of the planes, and the radio was very loud and saying, um, encouraging Chil Chileans to uh, denounce their foreign visitor, their foreign neighbors. So there was uh, a lot of incitement in the radio uh, announcements. It was very, a very uh, sharp sort of military kind of radio announcement. Um, then you started seeing violence on the streets, didn't you? There was well, constant was, gunfire, wasn't there? There was constant gunfire, but there was also a curfew. So it was, I was in my home and I heard the machine guns, and I heard the tanks rumble by the front, and I heard the strafing of the planes on the city. But I listened to the radio to see if I could understand what was happening. I mean, I knew there was a coup, and I, I knew that they were asking Chileans to denounce their foreign f uh, neighbors. So it was a very frightening time. You were caught out once but the, in the coup, weren't you? Um, in the curfew. I was, but that was after Charles came back from Viña del Mar. Charles and Terry were there for the Sunday after they'd been gone for a week, after there'd been a 24-hour coup. Finally, the coup was, I mean, I don't mean 24-hour coup, I mean curfew, 24-hour curfew for many days. Uh, and then the Saturday after the coup, the curf curfew was lifted for a couple of hours. So I went across the street to get a few vegetables because there was somebody selling vegetables. And uh, I went right back inside. Actually, I, I thought Charles was safe because he was in Vigna. And then on Sunday, he and Terry came back to our home, and he told me of his encounter with the U.S. Navy people taking so much credit for the smooth operation of the coup. Literally, and U.S. officers that he'd bumped into yes, in Vigna del Mar. exactly. And he felt that the, it was very dangerous information because he knew they should, he was a journalist. He knew they weren't supposed to be there um, participating in the coup. he knew that he'd learned coup. too much. Yes, he did. And so the next day, he and Terry went to the center of town because they were going to try and find how we could, how we could leave Chile. At that point, we, we felt it was definitely uh, our safety at stake and that we should try and leave Chile. 
Um, and I, my papers went in order. Cause that's what I was supposed to do that day. They went to the, to the beach. So I went to another part of town to look after some friends to see if they were all right. Because people had been pulled out of their homes. You know, I learned from the neighbors when the curfew lifted for a little bit that people were being pulled out of their homes, that piles of books and papers were being burned. And It was a terrifying atmosphere. It was a terrifying, utterly terrifying. It was, it was impossible to comprehend the level of terror that came into that city overnight with the coup. It was extraordinary and absolutely impossible to expect, foresee, understand, or even articulate and explain afterwards. Tell um, me about the last time you saw your husband. Well, on Monday, when we decided that he would go into the center of town and then I would check on, uh, on our friends in the other part of town, um, we said goodbye at the bus uh, because uh, one was going downtown and one was going where I wanted to go. And so my bus came first, and I kissed him goodbye, and I said, I'll see you tonight at 5. And, um, and that was the night I got caught because of the trends, uh, the terror in the bus drivers and the absolute chaos in the transportation system. I was caught downtown, and I couldn't walk home before the, the coup, I mean the curfew, pardon me, before the curfew took effect. By the time you got back to the house, the next day, what did you find? I found the house and had been totally ransacked. Totally ransacked. Everything was totally strewn uh, over our, the rooms of our house. And um, our landlord neighbor came out of his home and said, they, w they came back several times last night. You should leave because they may come back again. So at that particular moment, I did not know that Charles had been there and been taken. I just knew that the military had been there, they had ransacked our home, and that I had to leave. Later on, when mm -hmm. Charles's father, Ed, arrived, and you got in contact with the embassy, and you started piecing together from witnesses what had taken place, and you discovered that Charles had actually been taken away. Tell me the attitude of the American embassy towards you. Well, even the first time I went in there to tell them that uh, the DINA, the Chilean intelligence, had been calling our old neighbors about Charles, their first question was, are you sure that he was taken? Uh, aren't you, don't, isn't it possible that you had an argument? When did you say he was, did he, was it a week ago? There was so they were provocative, immediate, you weren't serious. Immediate obfuscation of what I was saying. In addition, I asked if I could stay there in the council because I didn't have a home to go back to. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, we, had, we don't have facilities. You know, all the other embassies were holding refugees. Uh, you knew they weren't serious, didn't you? I knew they weren't serious, and I had no other place to go. I knew that they didn't, that, that this is what they had wanted to have happen, and I had no other place to go. Later on, mm -hmm. when Charles's father arrived, you were taken from hospital to hospital, from mortuary to mortuary. Tell me what that was like. Well, we tried to cover as much ground as we could, and sometimes Ed would go one place and I would go another to, to ask about Charles, to, to find out if anyone had heard of him. Um, mostly we went together, but um, it was, it was um, an effort that was, um, you know, you kept hoping that Charles was going to turn up, and yet it was every day that he didn't turn up was, was a difficult realization, because every day meant it, it would be less likely that he would turn up. At least it seemed that way to us. You went at one point to the stadium mm -hmm. where most of the opponents, or a lot of the opponents of the Pinochet regime, had actually been incarcerated. There were something like 10,000 people who were kept there. What happened when you went there? Because you appealed for Charles to come forward if he was there, didn't you? Actually, it was Edmund who, who was in the stadium and called for Charles on the microphone. And one of the prisoners did come forward. And for a moment, Edmund thought that it was Charles. And then it obvious, and then it wasn't, and and he was extremely disappointed. Um, 
and it was very much as it, as it was shown in the movie. Um, but it was Edmund who called out. In the movie Missing. In the movie Missing, right. As the days went by then, mm -hmm. you became more and more certain that Charles wasn't going to come back. Uh, let me say this. Edmund Horman was very determined to find his son. So, even though I had, I had been very frightened when I hadn't encountered him in the first ten days before Edmund came down, I was absolutely with him in terms of taking every step to try and find Charles. And, of course, it wasn't an it wasn't until a member of the Ford Foundation, an employee of the Ford Foundation, told Ed Horman that Charles had been killed in the stadium. It wasn't anyone from the, Chil from the Chilean officials. It wasn't the Americans who told us. Um, and of course, we found out later that, that other people who had been called by, by the Chilean intelligence had called the US Embassy to say, Charles Horman has been detained. Um, I. I we just did not get the kind of help we expected, or Ed Horman expected to get from the American officials. And when we learned from the Ford Foundation, then Ed told the American officials, and they told the Chileans, and all of a sudden, the body of Charles Horman appeared in the morgue, and they said that the fingerprints had been misfiled. So it is only because Ed Horman pushed as hard as he pushed that we found out at all that Charles Horman had been killed in Chile. To this day, you don't really know what happened, do you? No. The Reddick Commission, however, um, did report uh, Charles's name as one of those who was extrajudicially executed in the stadium. And so that is confirmation of what we knew uh, in terms of his having been brought to the stadium his and our the report from the Ford Foundation that he'd been executed in the stadium. But it uh, took seven months, didn't it, to get the body? It took many months to get the body. Um, Ed Horman and I went back to New York and then uh, a few weeks later asked for the body to be shipped and we were told that for health reasons the Chilean government refused to do it. And it wasn't until uh, a senator from New York, Jake Javits, actually said to the Chilean government, send that body back, or we, we're not going to send you what you just asked us for. Is it in any way conceivable to you mm -hmm. that the Chilean authorities at that time would have executed an American citizen without the nod from the American officials who were present in Chile? Absolutely inconceivable. They were looking for recognition. Um, and. If the U.S. Congress had known that uh, two uh, Americans had been executed by Chilean forces at that time, that recognition would not have been forthcoming. I'm certain of it. And since Kissinger and Nixon had been pushing so hard for this event to happen, they were also eager not to ma have very much information about Charles Horman and Frank Taruji come back to the United States. More than a quarter of a century later, mm. the State Department issued a statement saying that the U.S. intelligence may have played an unfortunate part in Horman's death. Does that go in any direction? Does that in any way I'll tell you why it enraged sound me. like a relief? No, I'll tell you why it enraged me enormously, because that was written in the 70s when we were suing Kissinger and the State Department for information about my husband's death. And they blocked out that opinion when they released that document to us in our court case. They didn't, they didn't take the cover off that information until now, 25 years after, you know, 27 years after the fact, 25 years after they wrote it. Because they said at best it was limited to providing or confirming information that helped motivate his murder by the government right. of Chile. And at worst, U.S. intelligence was aware that the government of Chile saw Horman in a rather serious light, and U.S. officials did nothing to discourage the logical outcome of Chilean government paranoia. That was our opinion when we filed our suit against Kissinger. It confirmed all that your worst fears. That was their opinion when we filed our suit against Kissinger. But they, did, they blotted that opinion out for 25 years. You believe the worst scenario, don't you? How can I not? When you look back over the period 
that you've spent trying to find the truth out about your husband. How angry does that make you feel? Well, I've been angry for many years, but you know, in order to go forward, you sort of have to try and manage the anger. And if, um, if, <laughs> if we can in any way get to the bottom of this, no matter how long it takes, it is worth the effort because it's so wrong. Charles's father died, didn't he, without getting justice. In 1993. Justice but his mother is still alive. Yes, she is. She's living in New York. Same. How determined is she? Elizabeth Horman is still very angry at Kissinger. She's very sure that... And she says, do you, know, do you know where Henry Kissinger was the night my son was killed? He was in the opera. He was enjoying himself. He was having a social event. How could he be there when, when the life of my son was, could have been protected by him? She's very angry. She's very angry about this. She has been all these years. She's 96. She's an artist. And I think that part of her way of expressing this anger, you know, she, she did some painting. Um, after this all happened that really reflected the sort of digestion of this this horror her only child you've joined forces with the relatives of other victims you're campaigning for justice you need money don't you you need resources sure we do how critical is that well, I think it's very important not only to us, but to all the families. Uh, I think that, w especially in our case, we have to try and put together the structure of command for this national stadium and know who was there giving orders, who did the executions, who ordered them, what happened. And it was such a time of so many people going through that there are a lot of cases that would benefit from understanding the structure better. So one of the things we are trying to find funding for, and I think we will be able to, is to, is to do the research to put that command structure in place so, so that we can all understand who was in charge when and who was giving orders for executions and who was carrying them out. That's part of it. Another part of our case is that we, we have many declassified documents that we need to have translated, very expensive official translations in order to be entered into court. And I think that some of those documents may you know, there a lot of them are in Chile, uh, or copies of them anyway, and uh, I think they may be helpful in some other cases, but certainly they're very important for us. Uh, and of course, these processes are, they're pushing the envelope of the judicial system in, in Chile, and uh, it takes... They've it made takes, some enormous progress, haven't they? They've made enormous progress, and I expect uh, a lot more progress. But we, we do think it's going to take some time. So. That's, that's what we have to fund. And I, I think we will be able to, but, uh, you know, it's, it's never easy. What would it take to bring you some closure? I want to know the truth. I want to know exactly what happened. And, um, and I think things are opening up in Chile, so we have a chance at that. You know, I think we have a shot of finding out. And I, I would like to find find the real truth about the U.S. involvement and how much they knew about my husband's death and whether or not they really fingered him. I think they did. I don't know how to get at this information yet. Uh, but I think that the whole concept of universal justice is really finding its ground in the world today. And, uh, and I think that this article about Kissinger and the crimes, his crimes against humanity are starting to open more consciousness about this and hopefully we can actually take it further. Joyce Holman, thank you very much for being with us on the Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello again. A good deal of wet weather around at the moment across the southern half of Britain. Some really heavy downpours, and those downpours turning increasingly to sleet and snow.
especially over the higher ground. It's really across Wales and the Midlands we need to be careful for. A lot of heavy downpours, thunderstorms, a good deal of spray on the roads, and also that snow falling over the higher routes. It's still going to be around this morning as well. A cloudy, wet morning across southern Britain, really. That sleet and snow continuing, especially over the hills, and also quite windy, feeling very cold. Quite windy in the north, still feeling chilly here, but a good deal of brightness. A few sunny spells, just a scattering of wintry showers in the far northeast. Now, through the day, the main band of rain gradually edges a little bit further south, doesn't make really much progress. More snow to come, especially for places like the Cotswolds and the Brecon Beacons. Further north, the bright skies do edge a little bit further south. And the showers get going a little bit more as well, perhaps some feeding down into the northeast of England. Now, one or two showers could affect the rugby this afternoon, but by and large, I think it will be sunny, but cold especially in that wind, and that really is the theme for the entire country through the afternoon. We could see nine in the far south, but it will feel a lot colder than that with a strong wind around. Now for Sunday, well, low pressure and weather fronts stick to the south. The isobars remain tightly packed further north, so still with some strong and cold, biting winds around. But a good deal of sunshine, especially further west, western Scotland, northwest England, and also northern Ireland. More of those sleet and snow showers filtering down off the North Sea all the time. And a good deal of cloud and still with some rain and sleet in the far south. And temperatures struggling, five or six at best. The weekend. Time to do what you want, when you want. But the news doesn't stop at the weekends, and neither does BBC News 24. The headlines are still every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Continuous news coverage, whenever you want it, on BBC News 24. As fighting intensifies in Macedonia, the United Nations warns of another refugee crisis in the Balkans. The world's main oil producers are set to make a massive cut in production. The two surviving hijackers of the Russian airliner are wanted in Moscow to stand trial. And a New York jury acquits rap star Puff Daddy on all charges. Hello, this is BBC News. I'm Raghi Omar. There's growing international concern over the violence in Macedonia between ethnic Albanian rebels and government forces. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Ruud Lubas, has warned that the fighting could trigger a major refugee crisis. The warning came as the rebels stepped up their clashes with security forces around Macedonia's main ethnic Albanian town, Tetovo, bringing life there to a standstill. Macedonia used to be a haven of peace in the Balkans. Not anymore. Nightfall and Macedonian forces far up into the hills at Albanian fighters hoping to break up the country and its power-sharing government. The people of Tetova, mostly of Albanian descent, are running for cover. They're also being forced to take sides. Some do feel second class beside the country's Slav majority. Some support the rebels. The country risks splitting apart. NATO has no mandate to fight here, but is firing off verbal warnings. Those who use violence instead of dialogue uh, must uh, get a rude message from the international community uh, that there is no profit uh, in what they do uh, by this uh, crude use of violence, especially against uh, civilians. NATO governments fear this crisis could become a war. The Albanian guerrilla bands first attacked in remote areas, but the government in Skopje couldn't stop the violence spreading westward. Tetova is the biggest target so far, dragging more and more civilians into the front line. Macedonia's people, some two million of them, had learnt to overcome ethnic and religious divides. Rather less than a third are Albanian by descent and Muslim by faith. 
the majority, some two-thirds, are Macedonian Slavs, their orthodox Christians. Political power is shared. The Albanian minority is represented with ministers in the government. The new fears are of Albanian extremists trying to create a greater Albania, demanding full independence for Kosovo and now fighting for chunks of Macedonia too. I am very worried, that has to be said, because uh, the... Uh the integrity, stability, democracy of Macedonia is, of course, important for Macedonia, needless to say, but for people that are living here. But it's also central to everything that we've been trying to achieve in Southeastern Europe for a long time, both peace and harmony between different national and ethnic groups. We're at about 1,600 meters. Already, American troops are watching for Albanians heading to Macedonia. These patrols protecting Kosovo have arrested fighters, but NATO is very reluctant to get drawn in any deeper. That resolve now faces another very severe Balkan test. James Robbins, BBC News. Oil exporting countries, or OPEC, say they've agreed to cut production in order to try to stop the price of oil falling any further. Analysts fear the move could lead to higher prices, which would exacerbate the economic slowdown in the United States. Emerging from some tough negotiations, ministers from the world's main oil producing countries are close to a deal. OPEC wants to cut production sharply. During their talks in Vienna, the ministers are hoping that if they reduce the amount of oil on the global market, it'll push up prices, an agreement's likely later today, one which will mean more expensive fuel for motorists. But the negotiators here show scant sympathy. Our aim is to stabilize uh, the price and to have a fair price. For drivers, it could be painful. Petrol prices may rise again during the months ahead. It couldn't come at a worse time. More expensive fuels unlikely to help those areas of the world where economic growth is already beginning to slow down. The future looks bleak. Another era of relatively expensive petrol. Uh, motorists have um, no great salvation in sight. But OPEC thinks the world can afford to pay. When OPEC makes the announcement in this room this morning, it knows it'll prove unpopular, but the organization controls a scarce commodity and is determined to make the most of it. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Vienna. Dr. Daniel Jurgen, the chairman of the Cambridge Energy Research Associates, an independent body which looks at future energy concerns, says the move will mean extra costs for consumers. It will, add, it will certainly keep oil prices in a higher range and may mean that they're going to be higher going into the summer and into the autumn. Otherwise, OPEC has really established what they say is their price ban, that they want their price to be between $22 and $28 a barrel. And this week, they were seen to get it pretty close to that bottom 22 are you expecting, I mean, uh, another war of words between consuming countries and the oil producing countries of OPEC? There'll, pro there'll be some because uh, in, certainly in the United States, uh, the number one concern is are we going to have a recession? And of course, a recession in the U.S. would have such big impact uh, around the world. But uh, there is this kind of also this desire to see some stability in oil prices uh, uh, so that you don't get these violent swings as we've had in the last couple of years which are destabilizing and bad both for consumers and for producers. I mean, presumably the OPEC producers themselves will say that the high oil prices at the gas stations passed on to consumers has not so much to do with their actions, but more to do with government taxes in those well, consumer cer countries. Certainly, certainly if you take the UK, uh, a $30 barrel OPEC uh, and motor vehicle fuel, uh, at the, on that same barrel of motor gasoline, the British government takes about $150. Now, in the United States, we don't have our taxes anywhere near as high, but in much of Europe, 70, 80 percent of the price is, is, in fact, tax. What's your own take in terms of OPEC's policy at the moment, focusing on price stability? Do you think that that is a wise course, or do you think that in terms of the global eco economy, that could prove to be a tad reckless? Well, I think that there's a lot of concerns out there and that anything that pushes oil prices uh, up substantially right now is going to be a negative on a fragile world economy. There are a lot of other things that are affecting it. You have the decline in confidence in the U.S., the dot-com, uh, the Internet uh, uh, meltdown and so forth. And uh, this time, what you, what you really need is, is, is stability and, and, and a bolstering of, of confidence. So I think OPEC is, in a sense, trying to be a central banker now, uh, keeping prices from going too high, but keeping them from going too low. But it's a tough, uh, it's a tough thing to, to fine-tune it. Uh, very, very briefly, what's it going to mean for the ordinary man in the street? 
Uh, it will mean uh, several pennies more uh, for a gallon of gasoline. Uh, I think the thing to watch is what happens in the summer and the autumn if we start to have tight markets then. But it's very intertwined with what happens to the overall global economy right now, and it's a very sensitive time. Russia has demanded that the two surviving hijackers who seized a Russian plane on a flight between Moscow and Istanbul should be extradited to Moscow to stand trial. Moscow describes them as Chechen terrorists. The plane eventually landed in Medina in Saudi Arabia, where Saudi special forces stormed it.